Our scripture lesson for today comes from the book of Acts, the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 22. Listen for God's word to us this day as we are gathered here for worship. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He said, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem among those who invoked his name? And has not he come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, you meet us in unexpected ways and surprise us with the abundance of your grace. By the power of your spirit, break open your word this day that we might hear your call on our lives to be more faithful followers of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whom we pray. Amen. One day, God was looking at earth and saw terrible behavior going on. So God called an angel and sent the angel to earth to better assess the situation. When the angel returned, she told God, yes, it is very bad on earth. 
95% are misbehaving and only 5% are being good. <laughs> While God was not pleased with these numbers, God was grateful for the people who were behaving. So God decided to send a word of thanks to the 5% who were being good. God emailed them a message of encouragement to help them continue with their good behavior. Do you know what the email said? Okay, I, I was just wondering because <laughs> I, I didn't get one either. It's a silly story. God sending an email with a word of encouragement. But it raises the question, how does God communicate? If email is not God's preferred means of communication, then what is? In today's text, God communicates in multiple ways. A sudden flash of blinding light, an audible voice of Jesus, and a vision to Ananias. God does not appear to be restricted to email, not saying that God doesn't communicate through technology, but it is without email, phone call, or text that God gets Saul's attention. In today's passage, Saul is traveling to Damascus, intent on persecuting people who confess Jesus as Messiah. Saul wants to round up those followers of the Christian way and bring them back to Jerusalem in chains, breathing threats of murder and violence against Christ's disciples. Saul is zealous in these acts of violence. He is a man on a mission, breathing hatred and resentment in and out, in and out. His desire to prevent these early Christians from corrupting the Jewish faith is so consuming that it animates him and has become his reason for living. Before Saul reaches Damascus, he is blinded by a light and collapses to the ground. He hears a voice say, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. In some way, the women and men Saul is dragging off to prison in chains are an extension of Jesus himself, his followers, his family, the very body of Christ. And although biblical scholars label this a conversion story, they also see it as a call narrative. It is a dramatic story of transformation that can happen when people encounter the living Christ. Saul's career as a zealous persecutor abruptly comes to an end. He is no longer the church's enemy number one. Saul surrenders to Christ and journeys into Damascus, blind, helpless, and a radically changed man. As we've mentioned earlier in the service, today is the first Sunday of Lent. It marks a season of deeper personal prayer and introspection. As we begin our journey to Easter, this is a time for you and me as individuals and also together as a community of faith to ask ourselves, are we following the call of Jesus Christ? Are we being faithful in knowing Christ and making Christ known? During the six weeks of Lent, we will be exploring these questions among many others. The preaching and teaching series of our Lenten journey is based on Adam Hamilton's book, The Call, The Life and the Message of the Apostle Paul. Adam Hamilton is the senior pastor at the United Methodist Church of Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas. He's the author of many books, several of which we have previously studied at Westminster. 
And this morning, we will watch just a portion of the video for today's journey class. Listen as Ad Adam Hamilton introduces the book, provides a lot of background information, and explains the profound impact Paul of Tarsus has had on the Christian faith. Let us watch. What would lead a first century rabbi to travel thousands of miles by sea and by land, to be beaten, imprisoned, and ultimately beheaded for his faith? It was a call, a call to turn the world upside down. This is the story of the Apostle Paul, whose writings continue to shape the lives of one third of the world's population a man second only to Jesus in his impact and influence on the Christian faith, and whose witness defines what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. No other human being aside from Jesus himself has had a greater impact on the world or on the Christian faith than the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul in his conversion experience encountering Christ was radically changed. And then he spent the rest of his life reflecting on the meaning of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, starting churches across the Roman Empire, writing letters to those churches so that in the end, 13 of the 21 New Testament epistles were written by him. His faith and his reflections on the meaning of Christ are what shaped and laid the foundation for the Christian faith and for Christian theology, which continues to shape our faith, Christianity's faith, to the present time. And over the next few weeks, we're going to retrace the story, the life, the message, the ministry of the Apostle Paul in the very places where he walked, in the places where he taught, in the places where he started churches. I'm excited to take you on this journey with me as we explore the life, the message, the ministry of the Apostle Paul. So let's begin. The story of the Apostle Paul begins in what is today Southeast Turkey, but what was at the time Southeast Asia Minor, in a city called Tarsus, which was the capital city of the Roman province of Cilicia. Paul's hometown of Tarsus was nestled between the Mediterranean Sea and the Taurus Mountains. If you were to visit there, you'd find that there's just one small stretch of road, Roman road from Paul's era that's been excavated. Most of the Roman city is underneath the current modern city of Tarsus. And then there is a mountain pass that the highway passes through today. Paul would have passed through in his day. Very famous on either side. The mountains have been cut away. This is called the Cilician Gates. And Paul would have passed through these gates on his way up to central Turkey or central Asia Minor on his second missionary journey. There is a well there that's called St. Paul's Well. Was it his well? Who knows? But it certainly does anchor the story and remind us that Paul grew up in this place. And it was there that he was raised in a devoted Jewish home. His name, given by his parents, was a Jewish name, Saul, named after the first king of Israel. But he was also, his family were also Roman citizens, and so he had a Roman name. His Roman name was Paul. He would have been trained in, in both the Roman schools, uh, in the Greco-Roman schools, and so he was familiar with Greek thought. He was familiar with the Greek language. Of course, it was his native language, probably. And, uh, and it was here that he learned the Greek philosophers. At the same time, his family was very devoted in their faith and their desire to follow God. And as a young man, he was sent to Jerusalem to study under the finest of the rabbis of the time, a man named Gamaliel. And it was there that he was trained in the, in the uh, law and in the prophets, in the writings, in the oral traditions of his people, and in the oral law that had been passed on from generation to generation. He was deeply devoted to God, zealous for the law, and he was trained in the school of the Pharisees so that he described himself as a Pharisee of Pharisees and as pertaining to the law, as blameless as one could be. This was the Apostle Paul, one foot in two worlds. Thank you. And unfortunately, we do not have sufficient time during today's service to watch the whole video. So I encourage you to join the journey class after worship if you're interested in delving deeper into the message of Paul and his background of that time. As you heard, Paul was a well-educated, extremely intelligent, biblically literate, young Jewish man. He was a Pharisee deeply devoted to God while also being a Roman citizen, a man indeed with one foot in two worlds. This 
is the man Christ calls to follow him. And because of who he was, clearly Paul had the right qualifications and the right gifts for the task of spreading the gospel message to the Gentiles, kings, and out into the world beyond. Did you notice Paul's ministry is possible because God called Ananias? In a vision, the Lord instructs Ananias to go to the home where Saul is staying and to lay hands on Saul so that he might regain his sight. As a Christian, Ananias is understandably skeptical and afraid. So at first, he protests. Saul's reputation has indeed preceded him to Damascus. But in a prayerful conversation with God, Ananias hears God's word of reassurance and encouragement. And we hear the transformation in Ananias' heart and mind as he greets Paul warmly as his brother. Like Ananias, you and I strive to live Christ-like lives. An important component of our ability to faithfully follow Christ is listening for God and noticing the movement of the Holy Spirit. It may not come as a sudden, blinding light experience like Paul's. You and I may find that God speaks to us in less dramatic ways. This is true for a Christian named Michelle. One day while praying, she heard God say, go buy Yolanda some groceries. Now, Yolanda was a difficult person who already owed Michelle $500. And Michelle thought of tons of reasons not to respond to God's call. But in the end, she did buy two bags of groceries and she left them anonymously on Yolanda's porch. Michelle mostly forgot about this, except to lament her lost money. But six months later, God nudged Michelle to visit Yolanda. So Michelle drove to Yolanda's home, went inside, and then, for the first time, Michelle heard Yolanda's story. Yolanda recounted times of extreme hardship and abuse from her ex-husband. Yolanda shared about a particular Friday night when she was facing another weekend without food for her children. And on the way home that night, Yolanda prayed, God, if I ever need a miracle, it is now. When Yolanda pulled into her driveway, she saw two bags of groceries by the front door. An angel sent them, Yolanda explained. And Michelle, who had been so reluctant to help Yolanda on that Friday night, never told her otherwise. God communicates in many ways. Out of a blinding light, Paul heard Christ's voice. Ananias saw a vision of the Lord. Michelle felt a nudge from God's spirit while praying. I believe God is always speaking through scripture and Bible study and worship and prayer, through circumstances, the church and other people, and in the wonder and beauty of creation. Theologian Peter Berger suggests, it is not given to us to make God speak. It is only given to us to live and think in such a way that if God's thunder should come, we will not have stopped our ears. Like Michelle, you and I can sometimes be closed-minded in our thinking, lacking in generosity, or stubborn in holding resentments. We may be blinded by ambition or in some way on the wrong path. Lent is a season in which you and I can be more intentional about unstopping our ears so we also might hear God speak. Christ calls us to follow that we too might be instruments of reconciliation compassion and forgiveness, channels of God's love and light for the flourishing of God's kingdom 
in the world. The life ministry and message of the Apostle Paul had an enormous impact on the world. What we understand about the resurrection of Jesus, the promises of God and Christ, and the working of the Holy Spirit come from Paul's answering God's call on his life. Theologian N.T. Wright explains the extraordinary significance in this way. If the death and resurrection of Jesus is the hinge on which the great door of history swung open at last, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus was the moment when all of those ancient promises of God gathered themselves up, rolled themselves into a ball, and came hurtling through that open door and out into the wide world beyond. Through Lent, we will journey with the Apostle Paul in the very places where he walked, preached, and taught. But as important as Paul is to the Christian faith, our study of Adam Hamilton's book is not meant simply to recount Paul's story. Rather, may studying Paul's life and message enable us to better hear God speaking and respond as Paul did. I pray these weeks might be an opportunity for you and me to listen for God and perhaps to find our hearts transformed and our minds opened. Christ may be calling us to a new way and onto a more life-giving path. May it be so for you and for me. Amen.